G'day, Troy Dean from WP Elevation, and welcome to episode 45 of the WP Elevation podcast. Our feature guest this week is Rob Walling. Rob has a couple of SaaS app products that have been home runs. One is Hittail, an uh, SEO keyword research tool, and the other is Get Drip, email marketing for startups. In this episode, Rob is going to explain to us how he has built two startup products and how he puts out so much information and why putting out information is critical to his success. And I think that the real key takeaway for me in this interview is how we can learn from what Rob's done and apply it to our consulting business. How can you start something in your consulting business without actually having to build anything or spend a lot of time inventing new services? So for example, how can you add a new service offering to your existing customers without actually building the service offering to begin with? One obvious example is email marketing. How can you sell email marketing to your existing clients without even building a solution? There's lots of great stuff in this interview from Rob in terms of how to approach this from a lean startup uh, point of view. In other words, how to get something to market without spending a lot of unnecessary time or money to make that happen. Rob is also very kindly giving away two one-year pro licenses for the GetDrip email marketing app. Now, they're valued at $100 a month. So they're two $1,200 prizes that Rob is giving away uh, the details in this competition are really easy. I don't actually announce it in the interview, so I'm going to give it to you right now. All you, need to do, all you need to do is leave a comment underneath this video and tell us how you've used email marketing in your consulting business. How have you used email marketing in your WordPress consulting business? Leave your comment underneath the video and I'll get Rob to swing by in a couple of weeks and award the prize. All right, stay with us. Let's elevate. This is the WP Elevation Podcast, helping WordPress consultants elevate. This episode of the WP Elevation Podcast is brought to you by Video User Manuals, the plugin that installs 60 video tutorials in the back end of your client's WordPress dashboard to teach them how to use WordPress, WooCommerce, and SEO by Yoast. And of course, you can now get your hands on the Video User Manuals plugin for just $1 for your first month. That's right, you can take it for a spin, install it on some client sites and see the true power of this plugin and how it will help you teach your clients how to use WordPress and help you build awesome relationships with clients and in fact win new clients. Check it all out at wpelevation.com slash VUM. You can see a walkthrough of the plugin and watch the video there that will show you how you can use it to get more projects and win more clients and you can take it for a spin for just $1 for your first month. Of course, it is then $24 a month after that to install on all of your client sites. Check it out at wpelevation.com slash VUM. All right, in this episode, the uh, Elevation Tip of the Week, by the way, this week is launch something without building it. I really encourage you to think about a new service that you would like to add to your consulting business, whether it's SEO, social media management, email marketing, landing pages, uh, conversion optimization, e-commerce, membership sites, whatever it is, what do you want to add to your business? What do you think will work? And then launch it without building it. So just watch this interview and learn how Rob did it. Launch something without building it. We did it with WP Elevation. We launched WP Elevation with a, an email and a landing page, and we hadn't even built the first webinar. And we did very well uh, on that launch. And now WP Elevation is a business accelerator program with hundreds of members all over the world just because we launched something without building it. So that's my elevation tip of the week this week. And what you're going to learn from Rob Walling in this interview is how he has done that to launch Hittail and Get Drip, two very successful software as a service apps uh, that he has. Well, uh, Hittail, I, I learned he acquired from someone else. He was a customer and the uh, app was the the owners were losing interest and not keeping it up to date so Rob bought it from them and repackaged it and rewrote it and relaunched it and it's now a huge success and then he uh, replicated that success with get drip the email marketing tool for startups and he did uh, get drip he launched without building anything without writing any code it's a fascinating interview there's lots to learn plus there are two $1200 prizes to give away which is ridiculous. Rob's giving away two one-year pro plans of GetDrip, which are valued at $100 a month each. So that's $1,200 a year. And if you want to take, if you don't win the prize, by the way, but you want to take Drip for a spin, you normally get a 20-day trial. He's offering all of us a 60-day trial with the code WP Elevation. 
more details in the show notes on, on how to get hold of that. So stick around for the interview. It's uh, a, a fascinating interview. There's lots to learn, and Rob is just such a great guy. Let's go meet Rob Walling. G'day, Troy Dean here from WP Elevation, and I'm super chuffed to have with me this morning, all the way from California, Rob Walling. Hey, Rob, how are you doing? I'm doing great. It's my pleasure to be on. Thanks for having me, Troy. Awesome. Thank you very much for joining us. For those that don't know, Rob is the man behind Hit Tail and Get Drip, uh, two apps that we're going to have a bit of a chat about. But he also puts out an enormous amount of information and content about starting up. So we're going to dive deep into that. Before we get started, Rob has very kindly sponsored an awesome prize for this week's podcast, two one-year uh, uh, pro accounts at Get Drip, which they're like $100 a month each. Is that right, Rob? That's correct. So that's yep. like two $1,200 prizes right there. Get Drip is awesome email marketing. We're going to dive into that a little bit later on and uh, talk about that. Uh, and also, Rob has offered a code for anyone who doesn't win the prize to take Get Drip for a 60-day trial. Normally, the trial is only 20 days, but you guys get it for 60 days if you use the code WP Elevation. So very generous of you, Rob. Thank you very much for that. Now, before we start talking about startup space and WordPress and the web in general, uh, when you were a kid, what did you want to be when you grew up? I always wanted to run a business, even from the time I was little, like eight or ten. My dad tells me stories about me wanting to sit, you're saying, you know, that I wanted to be a businessman. And yeah. I don't know where that came from. I know that early on, I really wanted, I knew that money, I loved reading, and I knew that I didn't have enough money to buy books. We, I grew up in a working class family. And so I was always like, well, how do I make more money? My dad's like, you own a business. And so that I latched onto that really early. Awesome. Yeah. It's not it's not it's not common for like young kids to you know you might fantasize about walking along in a suit and a briefcase but it's not common for 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 kids to actually know that they want to go into business. Yeah, I I don't I genuinely have no idea how that happened. I know that by the time I was old enough to even have a little bit of money that I started buying candy and reselling it at a markup, <laughs> buying comic books and reselling it at a markup in school. And that that's an addiction, right? As soon as you do that, you're like, wait a minute, I can I can double the mo- you know, the amount of money I have in a week and th- I never look back from there. I mean, I was probably in 4th grade maybe when that started and wow. it, it's been it's been all entrepreneur ever since. Awesome. That's awesome. Uh, when did you discover the web and and realize that okay, this is something that I can leverage from a business point of view. Yeah, I discovered it in college, which was in the late 90s. And it never occurred to me there would be business on the web. So I was not uh, totally not one of those visionaries who came upon, you know, upon it and like Jeff Bezos, right? Wow, I got to start Amazon. It wasn't until really it was uh, probably 1999. I was working as I got a job as a programmer for a dot com. And that's when I realized, oh, there's a ton of money being dumped into this. It was the fake VC money, right? It wasn't actual mm. revenue. It was just a bunch of investment. But um, that's when I realized there's something here. And I don't know if it's going to come to fruition now. Uh, but then within a few years, I, I ran my own consultancy for a couple of years. And uh, all the marketing was online. And that's when it clicked. It's like, huh, you get some content out there. You get a Google footprint. You get a reputation. And and that's where it is. So that was the early 2000s. Wow. And now you're, you're typically not a traditional kind of WordPress guy who a lot of the people that we have on the podcast are, but some of your products do interface with WordPress very well. So this next question is relevant. Do you remember the first time you saw the WordPress dashboard? Absolutely. Yeah, it was. Um, so I, I started blogging heavily in 2005 and I was using, uh, I don't even know, if, I don't know when WordPress launched. Do you know? Was it out in 2005? It was 2003. Okay. So it wasn't, so I was a .NET developer at the time and WordPress was not on my radar. So I was using community server. It was kind of a clunky old .NET thing. And the first time I saw the WordPress dashboard, I think was in 2006. It was about six months after I started my blog and it, it smacked me in the face like, oh my gosh, you made a terrible choice. Like, even though that's in PHP and you know, you know, I, I knew a little bit of PHP, even though that's a different language, there's no way I should have chosen this other platform. And, and then I eventually migrated to WordPress and that's what my blog's on now. So, so were you, in your consulting business, were you consulting, were you a .NET consultancy or did you end up being a WordPress consultancy? I ended up being a .NET consultancy. Early on, I did everything that was available. I did PHP and Cold Fusion and whatever people hired me for. Um, and we'll probably talk about that a little later with some of your other questions. Yeah. But I, I, I really optimized and I became a, a .NET. I, I doubled and tripled down on it and that's when things really did well for me. When you, when, when you meet someone for the first time these days and they say, hey, Rob, what is it you do? How do you describe what you do in one sentence? What's your elevator pitch? I say that I run a small software company that helps online businesses market their products. 
And that kind of encompasses, because Hittail is an SEO keyword tool, so yep. it helps you rank in Google, and then Drip is email marketing. And I have a few others that don't quite fit into that, but that's the that's the bulk of what I'm focused on these days. So I like this because, you know, if someone says to you, so you, you identify, I like this because you identify your target market in that elevator pitch. If someone says, well, you know, we're a bricks and mortar business, we don't have an online presence at all, you're like, well, I probably can't help you. Probably not a good fit. Yeah, you you probably need a consultant, you know, if you're going to go from from nothing to a to a presence. But if you already have a presence with a decent amount of traffic, like I can, we can help you optimize. We'll help you get more traffic. We'll help you get more leads using email. So. Mm. Um, I'm, I just need to make a note here because some of these questions I want to ask, I think are going to tie in, but I, let me just draw a link here so I don't forget. Uh, in the meantime, um, let's enlighten our customers by telling them, our, our listeners by telling them, uh, what do you actually spend most of your time doing? Are you still on the tools coding or are you doing biz dev, high level strategy stuff, support? What is it that you do? Yeah, I, so I don't code very much at all anymore. I love to code, love it. And if I could do it every day, I would, but it's not the most valuable use of my time these days. So most of my time is spent removing obstacles for my team. I have four full-time guys who work for me, developers and support, and then I have a handful of contractors around the world, virtual assistants and such. And I just spend the day trying to keep them moving. And then with the remainder of my tiny free time, I do all the other stuff you mentioned, which was I throw a conference and I have a podcast and a blog and, uh, and then I push my product forward. I'm, I'm the marketing biz dev partnership guy, although I don't consider myself that, but that's really what the tasks that I do on a day-to-day -day basis are trying to connect with folks who, um, in my network who, you know, can hopefully benefit from the stuff we have. So there's no one else in your organization doing marketing or biz dev. You've just got developers, you've got some VAs, but you're the guy that's really pushing revenue and pushing sales. That's right. At this point, that's right. And I, I lo am looking to expand that a little bit. I've had an in I had an intern help me out for three months, and he did a really good job with that. And so that was me toying with the idea of, huh, can I bring someone on? Because there's obviously a lot of tasks that I need some help with. So I think that's probably my next hire. Mm, interesting. We're going to talk a little bit more about that in, in more detail. Uh, what's the one thing that keeps you awake at night? What's funny, that's changed over the years. Um, <laughs> it's always And in retrospect, it's always laughable by the time I'm a year or two out. When I say, really, that's what kept me up? You know, it was like, oh, I'm not going to get any consulting clients or, oh, I'm not going to be able to grow big enough. Oh, I'm not going to be able to launch a product business. Oh, I'm not going to be able to make enough money and quit my job. You know, and on and on and on. Each of them is like, well, of course, of course you could do that because you set your mind to it. And so these days what's keeping me awake is, can I do this again? Can I reproduce? I have a number of successful products. I have a track record, but can I do it again? Were they all flukes? Am I the imposter? Am I, you know what I'm saying? It's that kind of stuff. It's your inner voice. That, that'd be the voice. And I'm sure I'll look back in two years and I'll be like, well, of course, Drip was going to do okay. Because, you know, because it's just going to do, it's going to do fine. Yeah, yeah. So you still have that. You still have the imposter. You still have the voice in the back of your head going, this isn't going to work. <sighs> yeah. Well, and especially when it takes longer than I want it to, right? If, if the success is really fast and hockey sticks quickly, then it, there's less of a reason to feel that way. But um, it always seems to take longer than, than you want it to. And that's when the voice starts chiming in of like, huh. Hey, he thought you could do this in, in a year, and it's been 18 months. Where is it at? You know, that's where I am now. So it doesn't matter how many home runs you hit. Every time you step up to the plate and you're going to swing the bat, you've got to fight that little <laughs> voice in the back of your head, right? That's how it feels for me, for sure. Yeah, yeah. That's, I'm sure that's how it feels for everybody. Just about everybody I've spoken to on this podcast and at conferences anywhere around the world, they're all, they all have the yeah. same kind of thing. So why do you think, and you know what happens, like most people give up when they hear that voice. Most people aren't good at, you know, dealing with that and getting through it. What do you think it is that makes some people like yourself just keep going and just go, well, you know, okay, I'm aware of that. Thank you very much. It's not very useful for me, but you know, I'm going to keep going anyway. Why do you think some people just pack up and it's all too hard and other people just keep going? Are we just stubborn idiots or? Uh, partly. I do think that's helpful. Um, I also think it's growing up. I think it's a learned skill for most people. So some people are born with it. There are people like Jason Cohen. You interviewed him. Yeah. That guy, I don't know if he ever has heard that voice in his life. Like he's, he's amazing. He's, he's one of the people that I most admire online. So I think he was born with something innate. I think the rest of us um, have to learn, have to figure it out. And some people learn it when they're 10 or 12. They have some things they fight through, whether it's it's playing a sport or dealing with family strife or whatever, they fight through it and it, it makes them a better person. You, you've you heard, um, you know, folks who have dyslexia early on or learning disabilities and fight through it, they wind up often being very successful because they had to deal with such adversity that they learn not to give up. And so I think there's an event in everybody's life. Mine was in my 
kind of the process of me growing up in my 20s. And um, I remember there was just a point where I thought, huh, I'm good enough to do this and I'm, and I'm going to make this work. And then it was years of, of pushing, but I, I, it's definitely a learned skill, I think. And there is, you know, that you, you talk about that years of pushing and we hear this word hustle a lot, right? And no one really knows what it means. What I think it means is that you just don't stop. You just, you just keep, you just try every avenue. You just do whatever you need to get over, get under, get around the hurdle in front of you. But, you know, it, it, I see this all the time. I see people all the time who are so close and then they just bail because it's too hard. Now, do you think that, and this is, you know, we're totally off script here, but do you think this yeah. is that it gets too hard or do you think that a part of them is actually afraid of what happens if this succeeds? Oh, what do I do then? Absolutely. Absolutely. I think the fear of success is, is a big one for someone who hasn't had that kind of success before because you don't know what's going to happen when you get there. And I also think the fear of... Uh, it's it's the fear of of like public embarrassment or of someone mocking you or of someone saying something about something that you put out in public, you know? The, the same reason that people have all these unpublished blog posts or all these unpublished mm -hmm. interviews or all these unpublished products that they, you know, every coder you know has a, has a laptop full of stuff they've written. Yeah. But it's, it's, it's risky. We all have been mocked in our lives at some point. And every time you do that, it's a little bit like going back to high school and thinking, man, is someone going to say something negative about me? I think, you know, we're, we're all scared of that at some point, at some form or fashion. Yeah. yeah. And you know, the irony is, I mean, I, I've had this a couple of times with some blog posts where I think, oh, you know, this is going to cause ripples. It's going to be really controversial. It could damage my reputation. Most of the time you hear crickets, right? I mean, yep. most of the time there just aren't as many people listening as you hope there would be. <laughs> Yep. People care a lot less than you think they do. I've seen, I've seen startup founders send out an email and say, we're going to launch this big product in two weeks and blah, 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 and do this big hullabaloo and then get down to the two weeks and they can't launch it. And I have the email me for advice and like, what should we do? And I said, no one's going to care if you just wait another two weeks. And as long as there's not press going out or whatever, but you have this big email list, just wait. No one will notice. Email them in two, two weeks. So it's been a month and they do and no one notices because people care a lot less about your stuff than you think they do absolutely and that's that's actually in itself a hard reality to come to grips with isn't it yes it is. it is yep yeah we are we are our own worst critics in general and we think that everyone is watching what we're doing in more detail than they are mm. uh this is gold i better get back on script um what do you do when you're not working how do you you know how do you yes balance yes i um i have a family i have a couple kids and a wife uh -huh. and i spend a lot of time with them Love uh, playing like board games, strategy board games, Dungeons and Dragons type stuff, Magic the Gathering with my eight year old. <laughs> really? Yep. And then we have uh, we have a little apartment on the coast of California, and we go out there a couple weekends a month, and that's kind of my my de stress time. Awesome. I'm a hearty believer in like when I work, I work, I focus, I work really hard. I have loud music playing. I don't want any interruptions. I want to work eight, ten hours straight. But when I'm not working, I don't want to think about work. I don't want to look at work. You know what I'm saying? Like I believe in a very uh, dichotomous relationship with it. Because when I'm not working, I, want, I need to relax. I need to decompress. So I try not to do both ever. This is really interesting. I was talking to Shane Pellman from Modern Tribe recently. Who's, they're, they're a big kind of WordPress um, collective of freelancers, if you like. And he was saying he works from home. He's got a room at home where when he's in there, he's working. And the family's not allowed to interrupt him. But when he's out of that room and he's in the kitchen cooking dinner, he's not allowed to check emails on the phone. Yep. How do you, when you switch off from work, you run a product business, right? You're doing sales every day. There are orders coming through every day. How do you resist the temptation to check your email and see the sales coming through? You know what I, I did is I stopped the sales emails. I only have them aggregate once a day on purpose. Like I get all the emails okay. of any sales at 9 p.m. at night. And I do work for a few minutes then. And all my billing for my, for my software as a service apps will run at 9 p.m. because that's midnight Eastern. You know, there's a bunch of reasons for it, but that's it. So I don't have to check because I know it's not going to be there. The only email that could be coming into my e inbox is support requests or problems. And so I don't want to check that while I'm, while I'm making dinner, you right. know. So there, there's no good news coming through. I like this. Yeah. So you've even, systemized, you've even systemized the systems and the processes to not interrupt you while you're switching off. I'm, I try to. I do my best. I won't act like I never check email on weekends or anything like that, but, right. uh, but I try to for sure. Right. If you could wave a magic wand and fix one thing about the business right now, what would it be? I want to get there faster. Um, <laughs> I, I'm enjoying what I'm doing. I'm on a trajectory, and I know I'm going to get there. I just want it to be faster. Where is, where is there, Rob? Um, that's a really good question. <laughs> <laughs> it's... Uh, 
I mean, isn't yeah. it all about the journey, man? You know, we're it supposed is. to like, everyone's always telling us, be mindful and enjoy the journey. It's all about the process. Yeah, Where is there? That's true. That's true. Um, I tend to be more about the destination, unfortunately. I'm more of a left brain engineer guy and I'm right. very goal oriented. And so... I could probably describe to you what there is, but it would be amorphous if I put it into words. But I, I know what it's, I know what it's going to look like because I've been there with my other products, if that makes sense. Like I've been there sure. before. I'm not the guy who's perpetually chasing something that continues to elude him. Mm -hmm. uh, I've, I've started and grown things to the point of, of hitting the goal that I wanted to, and I have goals for drip. So it's definitely, I'll, I'll put it this way. It's definitely, you know, in this, in seven figures of revenue and uh, it's having, flexibility and leeway and have feeling like the product is approaching done. And that's, you know, we're approaching two years now working on drip and it's, it's not done yet. And I thought it might be, you know, mm. I thought it might be getting there before now. So mm. what's the, uh, what's the plan with drip? Is it to eventually get it to a point and sell it? Or is it to get it to a point where it's kind of running on autopilot and you can go do something else? Either one, either one. I've done both. And I don't, I, at this point, I don't have a preference and it's a little too far out to say. Drip has become a big, you know, it started off as a small idea and I was going to build it um, a lot like my other businesses. And then it's become a big, a bigger idea. It's just entering, it's in the auto, uh, uh, the automation, uh, I'm sorry, the marketing automation space, email marketing automation. Mm -hmm. And so it's now in a very big market. And so um, there's a lot more work to be done and I it's at least a few more years and I'm going to have to put into it. And so I haven't really thought about exit strategy. Okay, we're going to come back and talk about Drip in a little, in a little while. But for those that don't know, let's just talk a little bit about Hittail. This is, sure. where, this is how I discovered you. Um, uh, tell us very briefly what Hittail is. Yeah, so Hittail is a, it's a SaaS app and it's a long tail keyword tool, which means that uh, it essentially, it doesn't go after a head search engine terms to rank in Google. It goes after terms that are that are much less competitive and that you can rank for pretty easily without building links. So it helps you know, any website, if you have a, a decent chunk of content, it will look through all of your existing keywords that people are finding you for in Google and it'll tell you, you know, there's there's 500 keywords everybody found you for last month. You have no idea what you should improve upon or how you should use those and Hittail just filters those down and says, Here's the 20 based on our algorithm that's analyzed a billion keywords. Here's the 20 that you should target because these are the ones, these are your low hanging fruit right now. Just write an article about these. Don't, you don't even have to build any links and you're really likely to rank high in Google for these. And it's ongoing. Every month you get new suggestions. Here's the thing I really like about Hittail, right? When I first discovered, I mean, I'm in the WordPress consulting space. So I, like we, I try and I've also like I, I've never been diagnosed, but I swear I suffer adult ADHD and I suffer shiny object syndrome. You put a new thing in front of me that looks like this and I can't resist the lizard brain, I sign up straight away, right? I take everything for a trial. The thing that about Hittail was, first of all, that this space is so crowded. When it came across my desk, I'm like, oh yeah, another one of these, you know, guaranteed traffic from the search engines. This is complete rubbish. But the thing I like about Hittail is that it kind of feels like there's, it kind of feels like a SaaS app with some consulting or some coaching built into it. So it's not just somewhere that stores data and analyzes data, but it kind of actually tells you what you should do next, which is something I really liked about it. But just go back to the, the question about the crowded marketplace. Why the hell, why the hell build a, an SEO keyword thing in, the, in, in that space when it's so crowded already? How did you know that you were going to get traction and not just become part of the noise? To be honest, I purchased this from the previous owner. I did not build it from scratch, and I was a customer of it. So they launched huh. it in 2006, and I became a customer in 2007 when it was a little less crowded in the space. Mm. And then around 2011, it started having a lot of outages, and the previous owner couldn't maintain it. So I acquired it from them because I knew the power. I was using it. I had been using it on my blog, on my product blogs, and, and had been gaining traffic from it. And the, it was obvious the previous owners had lost interest, and so the the service was suffering. So I acquired for it from them and uh, revamped it and rehabbed it, redesigned it and uh, fixed a bunch of bugs. And so I, I entered it because I know the, the SEO space is crowded, but Hittail had been around and it had a name for it. And I also, what I also love about Hittail, the reason I really wanted it is because it's simplicity, right? It's mm. not another tool mm. where you go in and you have to, you need a PhD in order to figure out what keywords mm. to target. Mm. The whole idea is you link up your Google Webmaster Tools account, bam, it dumps, uh, 
you know, all your, all it gets a lot of your not provided keywords back for mm. one. And then number two, it tells you which ones you should target. And I was like, this is exactly the kind of tool that I like to use. So hopefully other people will too. So scratching your own itch was the yeah. reason for, for wanting to get behind Hittail. I think that's when I discovered it was around about the 2011 time when uh, it came across my desk. Now, <clears throat> the whole, um, the thing I also got about it too is when I signed up for Hittail, I started getting emails from you. Well, for at least the subject line, you know, the, the from was always from Rob at Hittail. I still get them. I still get emails from Rob at Hittail. <laughs> and I was like, oh, yeah, this guy's, you know, these guys are really cute. They've kind of invented this guy named Rob who's, you know, pretending to email me as, you know, one of the right. founders. And then I kind of discovered, I think I might have emailed you back a few times and we had a bit of a, you know, bit of, and I was like testing you out. Is this guy really huh. responding to emails? And I'm like, this guy actually is the guy behind the product. And it, you know, because we've been using Basecamp and all these different SaaS apps, right? And you're never going to get an email from Jason Fried if you're using Basecamp, right? So right. This, was a, this was a really different thing for me in this SaaS space is that the guy behind the product was actually emailing, right? Sure. Then I, then I, and there's something similar going on here because then I started using things like BidSketch and PlanScope and I start realizing, ah, there's something. And I, then I realized that all these guys have learned from you and been part of your Micropreneur Academy. And so... Was that a conscious thing or was that just, was that like an accident? Oh, whoops, I've emailed from myself and now I've got this relationship with these clients right. <laughs> or was it a conscious decision? It was definitely conscious. Yeah, because I, I mean, people want to buy from people and they want to buy from people they like. It's about relationships. I, I really do try to build, as much as I can't answer every support email that's sent in, I do answer every reply to any of those emails that come through. If someone replies and says, hey, Rob, unless it's a question like, how do I, you know, click my settings or whatever, then my support guy handles it. But if it's anything for me, it comes to me and I answer it. Um, and actually a lot of them go directly to me. So yeah, I, I was very deliberate about that. And I do that with Drip as well. And I do it with mm. MicroConf and the Micropreneur Academy and all this stuff. So mm. I do get a lot of email as a result. Um, but I just, I wouldn't go back, you know, like this is, this is the way I want to run businesses. I don't want to grow a business that's so big that I can't, that I can't, I don't know a lot of the customers and I can't relate to them and have a conversation. We're going to talk about that in a moment because one of your, one of your things is, is uh, start small, stay small, your, your, your startup book. But do, you know, were, were you, did, like, do you have a moment where you thought I've just, you know, given people my email address and my email inbox is going to be flooded and the rest of my life is going to be responding to emails? <laughs> I, no, because I, I worked my way up to it, right? I started blogging in 2005 and you slowly, gradually get more email and you learn if you publish your email here, you'll get a lot, but if you just kind of send a few here and there, you won't. And so it wasn't, it wasn't some kind of complete shock. It was all a gradual process. Okay. So what's your involvement with, with Hittail these days? Are you still active in Hittail? I am. In fact, we just rewrote it. It was in classic ASP, which is a 15-year-old programming language, and we just rewrote it in Rails. And last night, we pulled, my developer pulled an all-nighter, and I got about five hours sleep. So wow. um, yeah, and we rolled it to new servers on EC2, and it's, it's all shiny and new and fast and feels great. So I'm still definitely, I'm still the primary marketer, the product manager who decides what features get built. I don't write any code on it anymore. Right. Awesome. And again, what's the plan with What's the plan with Hittail? Is it the plan just to keep it running on autopilot? It's or? Well, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's doing well. We're, I mean, we're still adding some features too. We get feature requests, but it's, it's a good, it's a nice simple tool. We may, you know, I've been hearing about, well, there's some other new stuff in the SEO space that I'm considering adding like a pretty major feature to it, but I don't, I don't know yet. It's, I don't know yet. So. So how do you split your time between Hittail and, and Drip? Um, the majority of my time these days is Drip. Okay. Um, I've been spending time managing Hittail and, and marketing it, but Drip is the focus right okay. now. So and, how did, yeah. when, when was Hittail at a point where you knew, okay, I have some bandwidth now to go do something new? When, when the marketing, well, I, when, when the product was quote unquote done, when I wasn't getting waves of feature requests anymore because a lot of stuff was built because the products mature over time, right? You, you just get enough built that it's a more of a complete product. They're never totally done, but they almost, yeah. they almost get there. Um, so when I didn't need a lot of features built and when the marketing was in place to, to kind of keep the flywheel going, I felt like, huh, I feel like I can step away right now and and move on to something else. And I, I learned so much, you know, with every product that I launch or, or acquire, I learned so much that I then realized, huh, I can take that and, and improve upon it. And if I do a product that has higher price points in a more competitive market, XYZ, you know, a couple other things in place, I think I can 10X 
I, I like to 10x my previous effort. That's kind of been my goal recently. And so that's that's when I decided was I was like, I think I've learned what I'm going to learn from Hittail, and I'm going to keep keep it going, and I like it, but it's not going to be my sole focus, and I'm going to move on to the next thing. So uh, why? Okay, so so was drip was drip the first thing that came to you when you were looking at doing something new? Was drip the obvious choice? Was that the first attempt? It was one of many choices. So I was going to either rewrite my book, like do a second edition. Um, I was going to potentially do some video courses. You know, I do a lot of training and stuff. So I was trying to decide between another app and more courses. Finally decided I wanted to do another app. And then I had sat down in my, my Moleskine notebook and I wrote mm-hmm. out all of the, I said, what problems do entrepreneurs and startups have? And I just started listing problems. You know, they, they might need virtual assistant help. They don't have enough traffic from search engines. They don't know how to create content for, you know, just what problems do they have? They don't do, they know they should do email marketing, but they don't. Blah, 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 right? I, I have this list. I still have it today. Um, and mm-hmm. I started picking through those. And one of them that I really latched onto was email because email has been a big thread for me. Every app that I've owned, I eventually implement email marketing in, into it in terms of building a list, giving out an email crash course. And it always, always, always has an absolute noticeable impact on my bottom line. Mm. And so I was thinking, you know what? I have enough knowledge and there's no tool out there that's doing it the way that startups want it done. So let's, let's think about doing that. So let's, and so, so, yeah, so it was the first. So let's talk about that because again, I, when you launched Drip, I got the pre-launch emails. I signed up. I was one of the first users. And I, but again, I'm like, come on, man! Really, this is such a crowded marketplace. I, the reason I signed up and the reason that I became an early adopter of Drip is because I wanted to see what you could possibly do that was different to what everyone else was doing. So some of the tools, like off the top of my head, without even thinking about it, Campaign Monitor, Get Response, Infusionsoft, Office Autopilot, Aweber, Eye Contact, Constant Contact. I'm going. If you came to me and said, give me $100,000 because I'm going to start an email marketing app, I'd go, Rob, what are you doing? You, like, you're just going to be part of the noise. How did you know that you were going to be able to cut through that noise and get traction? Well, the, the, there were two things. The first is I didn't know, but I had a good feeling that if I niched down and made it a tight, tight niche for, for software as a service and like digital products, I knew that there was unrest because everybody, I, I know a lot of, of small bootstrappers and startup founders and all that kind of stuff, people selling membership websites, and they all have one thing or another they don't like about Infusionsoft and MailChimp. Those are kind of the two big market Yeah, I forgot market MailChimp, leaders. yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so MailChimp's the big email marketing and, and yeah. Infusionsoft's the big marketing automation. There's, they have a lot, they do a lot, and they have a lot of customers who love them, but there's a lot that they don't do for our specific use cases. And I just heard it over and over, so I figured I could improve on that. Then what I did is I went and I emailed a bunch of people that I knew, and I said, if I build this Mm. and it fixes these issues, would you buy it? And Mm. I got 17 yeses over the course of – I got 11 yeses early on, and then I slowly built on that. So I had 17 people who said, yes, I will pay you – and I had named a price already. Um, I will pay you 99 bucks a month at the time if you fix those things. So that's what made me – I didn't write a line of code or I didn't have a line of code written until I got there. That was my So you had 17 people – so that yep. they would pay you a hundred bucks a month yep. to fix this problem. Yep. And you started a business yep. with the verbal promise of seventeen hundred dollars a month in revenue. Yep. <laughs> I did. And what I did, well, but here's what I did. I told the developer, here's what I want you to build. He started building it. Then I went, I put up a landing page, and then I started running Facebook ads. Uh-huh. I started blogging, talking about it, you know, doing what you do to, to spread the word, uh-huh. and trying to hone in on what is the, va- the one-sentence value proposition that everybody's looking for, or, or the most people are looking for. And that list started building really quickly. And in the end, I had 3,500 emails on that list. And by the time I got to about five or 600, I started realizing, yeah, this thing has legs. Let's keep building it. And if, if it hadn't, if it had just died off and I only had 200 emails on that list, then I wouldn't have had him finish it. Okay, my, 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 my head is just trying to catch up here, right? And I'm sure that our audience are trying to catch up as well. You, hadn't, you were building a product. It wasn't built. It wasn't even, like, it wasn't even in the browser working. You couldn't click on it, nothing. And you, were, no. you put up a landing page. You were blogging about it. This is the lean startup methodology, right? It is, although I wasn't acting like it was built. Um, so, th- so I've been doing this since I started. Lean Startup came along and and they said, hey, do this. And I was, I remember when that happened, I was kind of like, yeah, I kind of already do that. You know, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> not saying I came up, I mean, I, I came up with it on my own, but it's not, you sure. know, I didn't popularize it like them. But uh, 
Yeah. So it, I wasn't acting like it was already built. I was just saying, here is what I'm building. Come be a part of like the next generation of email marketing. You know, I never use cheesy terms like email marketing 2.0, but that's the idea. I was trying to figure out what, yeah. how can I build the next thing? And that's really what Drip has, has strived, what I've strived to push it to be is to reimagine because MailChimp, it, it's a good tool. I've, I had four MailChimp accounts as of a year ago, but it was built 10 years ago. You know, AWeber 15 years ago, Infusionsoft, I don't know, 10 years ago. So you got to every five or 10 years, we rethink the stuff and you just have better tools to build it. And that's really what Drip is trying to be. So did, were you like, were you nervous? Were you like, I, I, I'm asking people if they'll pay me for something that I haven't even built yet? Were, weren't you nervous? That, okay, wow, what if, what if their expectations, I build their expectations up so much and then I launch the product and I can't meet their expectations. Wasn't that kind of, wasn't that a little voice of doubt in the back of your mind? A, a little bit. Um, the way I got around that is I didn't I, I promised them some pretty simple benefits, right? I promised them a real value proposition of I've used email marketing and all my apps. It impre- increases my conversion rate, which increases my bottom line. I'm going to make that dead simple for you and explained a little bit how I was going to do that. Would you, would you try this? So I didn't promise the world. I didn't say I'm going to build MailChimp plus Infusionsoft plus Entreport, you know, because you just can't, you can't build that. It's too big. So I had this very simple small value prop, but it was value proposition based on uh, increased revenue. And I think that's an easy, easy thing to communicate. There's one thing also I really liked about Drip when it launched, which is that your value proposition, I can't remember what it was when I signed up, but it basically it basically was like a guarantee. Like we guarantee that this will convert into more customers, right? That's right. And it yep. did, by the way. We took Drip for a spin and it did. It like there's there's no doubt it actually worked. The other oh. thing that I really like is that you offered to write an email campaign. Yes. That was the big so that was the big hang up that so many startups have. They know they should be doing email marketing. But nobody does it, or very few people do it, because of the time intensity of setting up that campaign. This is startups and bootstrappers. I don't want to, you know, I'm a self-funded guy as well. But so that's what I did. I said, I want, I want us to do a concierge service where if you have an ebook or if you have five blog posts that you've written that you're not using anymore, you know, that they're they're two months old and so nobody's reading them, we will take those and turn them into your course for you. That was the big one of the big selling points. Is I want people to be able to get value out of this this product without having to sit down and write a bunch of content. We also have a copywriter uh, that I use who's very good, who can do one totally from scratch, but then you have to pay for it because we pay him. But yeah, that was, it's a big thing. If you're going to start an app, I, concierge services are a big deal. So taking, we're going to talk about that in a moment, taking the, taking the existing ebook or the existing blog post and turning that into a campaign, you don't charge for that service? No, it's free. Wow. Yep. We actually extend your trial a week because it takes us about four or five business days to do it. Not total, but you know we're backed up so much sure. that my my uh, support guy puts them all. Down. I mean, he's he's a virtual assistant slash support slash does a lot of stuff for us. And early on, I was putting them together myself. We have some templates that we use, and then once I got it down to a process where I was like, yeah, this is this is really the same thing every time. You know, we tweak some stuff here. We were we help him try to improve your titles. Like I actually do look through and give feedback as well. Mm-hmm. Give kind of a once over of things. Try mm-hmm. to get your headlines better. Mm-hmm. Calls to action, but. Um, yeah, we do that. We do that for free. It's and kind again, of a no-brainer from our perspective, you know. But again, weren't you nervous that you know? Oh my God, this just could completely blow up my inbox, and I could be overloaded and have to spend every weekend rewriting people's headlines. Wasn't that wasn't that a fear? A little bit, but we didn't launch to. That's why we didn't launch to three thousand people at once. We launched to like three and four hundred person yeah. blocks on the list, so yeah. I could keep it under control because we're a very small team, right? At that time, it was me uh, and. Uh, but like an intern developer and then a uh, a support guy, you know? And so it was kind of like, I guess he wasn't an intern, but yeah, it, it was just three of us. And so I was like, man, we're not gonna be able to handle it if we launched to 3,000. So we did a yeah. very slow launch because I didn't have the team to handle it. I noticed that as well, that you were launching to like three or 400 people at a time. And you know what? It actually, and I'm sure you know this, but it kind of, it, it made me like froth at the mouth. I'm like, when are you gonna open the doors and let me in? When does my That's cohort cool. get to come on board? Yeah, yeah. It was very good. <laughs> That's, it's that exclusivity, you know, trying to, yeah, I didn't, yeah. I didn't do that actually on purpose. If I could have launched to 3,500 at once, I would have done it. Right. Um, but that was a nice added benefit of, of being able to launch to smaller groups at once. Cause there was, there were people on Twitter asking, when can I get into your app? I mean, how, how often does that happen? Yeah. You know? Yeah. That's cool. Okay. Let's talk about, so you've obviously got some experience, right? You've hit a couple of home runs with Hittail, with, uh, with Drip. Now let's talk about the, the, the information products that you put out. So uh, you have a book called Start Small, Stay Small. 
Uh, you have a podcast called Startups for the Rest of Us. You have a conference called MicroConf. And you have uh, a, a membership website, by the looks of it, called the Micropreneur Academy. And some of your success stories, by the way, I love the map on the Micropreneur uh, Academy. We've got one of them in our membership website as well. This shows everyone in the program and where they are in the world. It's a really nice touch. And some of the sample products that have come out of the um, Academy, Bid Sketch, Ruben Garmas, of course, actually recommended that I talk to you on this podcast. So, hey, Ruben, here it is. Um, Plan Scope, Brennan Dunn, who we know really well. Uh, AB Press Optimizers, a conversion optimizer tool for WordPress. Uh, there's a bunch of tools here that I've used. Tell me, you know, and this, I don't want to get too Andrew Warner on you, but tell me, like, at what point did you say, I think I've got enough success that I can start teaching this stuff? Yeah. Um, it was at the point where, so I had a blog and I started blogging about, I used to blog about software development, like more technical stuff. And then I switched when I started having a little bit of success with products. As soon as I started blogging about that, I started getting emails, people saying, whoa, what'd you do here? How did you learn this? So uh, that showed me that, huh, I know just a little, uh, just enough that I could start teaching it. But, but I didn't want to yet because I'm a typical developer and I feel like embarrassed when to, to teach other people, if, unless I'm an expert, right? So it was about another two years after that, and it was after I had done another two or three sites. And I was, I was able to quit consulting. I was working full-time for myself, live, making a living off products. It wasn't you know, tons of money, but I was living in Boston and able to pay for mortgage and do that kind of stuff. So I mean, it was a low six-figure income. And I was making that purely from products, and I wasn't working full-time, and I realized, I think I've kind of figured this out well enough to teach somebody about it. So that was when... I thought about writing a book, to be honest, um, and I built the academy instead because as I started writing the book, I realized, gosh, there's so much information that needs to be in screencast, in audio, in, in images, you know, in this stuff that I can't include really well in a book. And so I built the academy first and then went back and, and wrote the book. So, you know, because, okay, I'm in the teaching space as well, right? And so we hear this a lot, and I just want to get your take on it. You get a lot of criticism from people saying, oh, well, if you were really good at this and you were really successful, why would you bother teaching us? You'd just be off doing it yourself. What mm. do you get out of teaching? Yeah, because I, I, he I heard that early on. I haven't heard that in years, to be honest. And early on, it really hurt my kind of hurt my ego or hurt my feelings. Yeah. But I am doing it myself. Like, that's, yeah. like the teaching is actually a small part. I mean, my, the bulk of my income has always come from products because that's mm. what I love. Mm. What I get out of teaching is twofold. One... I really enjoy it. I love. I, I enjoy helping people, and I enjoy being an expert. Like, who doesn't enjoy being able to to share what you know and feel? It makes you feel good about yourself, you know. Mm. And also, it helps people. Like uh, you, the list of people who have emailed me and said you're teaching, whether it's stuff they paid for through the academy, whether it's free stuff we give out on the podcast. I mean, honestly, dozens, if not in the hundreds of emails, people saying, "Wow, you've really impacted the way my business runs. You have changed my life. You have changed the way I've done this." That is, that's like an, that's my legacy. Like what, yeah, yeah. I, I, you know, there was a time where I went off and I started, I had the products, um, I was making a full-time living and I wasn't teaching and I was working like 20 hours a week maybe. And I was just, I was living it up and I got really bored because what, what kind of a life is that when you're not interacting with other people? Mm. And so that's the second part that I get out of it is it's my, they, the people who I teach are my community. Some of my best friends in the world are now now came through the academy, and we hang out at microconf. Mm. And I look forward to the, some of the best days of my year are going to microconf and hanging out. Mm. So it's both for the ability to help, the ability to feel like an expert, which makes me feel good, and share what I know, and then the community. It's kind mm. of all the three of those things. Mm. So the obvious question is, uh, you know, do you sleep, and how? The hell do you produce so much content? You've got a book, you've got a podcast, you've got the Micropreneur Academy, which is full of video tutorials and training and screencasts, you've got the MicroConf, you've got two products. How do you manage all this stuff? I don't, I try not to do two things at once. So I took time off from everything to go write the book, mm -hmm. then I published the book. And mm -hmm. then the next thing was we started the conference. And then we got that, uh, we got a the first year it was a tremendous amount of time. Then we got a coordinator, so now it's not much time. So then I said, well, now I'm ready to do a product. You know, So I, I bookend them next to each other. Anyone who tries to do two things at once, I think is going to fail unless they're really good. Because mm. I work about 40 hours a week. Mm. And I have a good team who, who helps out with all the projects. But in general, everything I'm doing is pretty streamlined by now. Trying to start up two things at once is mm. really hard. Having to maintain five things and starting one up is totally doable. That's mm. really what it is. Uh, how? What's the um, 
with the academy, what's the uh, how do you, how do you structure that? Is it just is it is it just like here's everything I know? It's all up there at screencast. It's like a vending machine. Do it yourself, or is it kind of rolled out like drip fed content? It's ro- rolled out drip fed, yeah, every month. So so the academy is at micropreneur.com, and it's uh, fi- like fifty bucks a month, forty seven bucks I think it is. Mm-hmm. And uh, there's about twelve months worth of content there, and then after that, you just kind of grandfathered in, and you can watch the academy. You know, watch the stuff for as long as you want. And there's a, everything's in audio and um, print. And then there's some screencast as well. And there's also forums in there. That's the, the community part of it. And, uh, yeah. And so do you have to like, do you have to like re-engineer all that content every year as things change and as you know, new trends are happening? Yes. That stuff definitely gets dated and we're, we're working on a solution for that now. Cause there's some content in there right now that isn't applicable anymore. And that's one of the dangers of having stuff like I need to go back and redo it and I don't have the time. So I, I'm trying to figure out, we're trying to figure out a solution to that. And that's something that we're going to be rolling out in the next month or two here. Hmm. Wow. Fascinating stuff. Um, all right. I, I kind of feel like we should get into the lightning round, our elevation round, uh, cool. which is something we do every uh, episode. For those that don't know, WP Elevation is a business accelerator program for WordPress consultants. So if you are building web, WordPress websites for clients or you want to get into the WordPress product space, uh, then come join WPElevation.com and get access to all of the stuff in our own little WordPress consulting academy that we've got. Uh, so the elevation round is I'm going to ask Rob a series of quick questions and he's going to give us a series of quick answers. Answers. What is the number one thing any freelancer or consultant needs to know? Niche down, become an expert in one thing, whether it's <laughs> your, you know, whether you're the best in, in your geography or the best in one topic. Focus. L- love it. What's the best thing you've ever done to find new customers? Uh, when I was consulting, actually, it was my blog. It was getting a surface area in Google and just writing a bunch of posts for about stuff I was doing, and it. I was shocked at how many clients I found that just stumbled upon me through Google. And then I never had to sell to them because it was inbound. Yeah. It's pretty cool. That's good, isn't it? Uh, how do you stop competing on price? By niching down and become the, becoming the expert back to number one. Yep. Yep, yep, yep. Uh, and any tips on writing better proposals? I, to be honest, I would go to bidsketch.com slash blog and I would read everything he's written and subscribe to that email list. That is it, right? That's the corpus. Of, Absolutely. Of to, he, I he's, totally yeah. second that motion. Uh, favorite tool for CRM? Um, I like Pipedrive. I mean, oh, yeah. just pipelines. Yeah, really fan. It's very simple, but that's I like simple stuff. Yeah. Uh, you, you've, you've obviously got a great, you've got a great aesthetic for user interface as well, because all of the stuff that you're involved in is like, you know, m- one of my old business partners used to call it numpty stupid. Like, you know, the <laughs> buttons are so big, you can't break it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I hire good designers. How about that? I don't have the skill, but I hire guys who know how to do it. So. Uh, what's the best way to keep a project and a client on track? Oh man, this is, there's two things. One is a uh, relationship. You got to build a relationship. If it's just a transaction, then they don't care. And the second thing is having the velvet rope policy. It's the ability to be able to turn clients away, right? So once you've niched down, once you're the expert, then you figure out how oh, this guy's kind of a red flag. I'm going to ditch him and you only take clients who are going to stay on track. Yep. Perfect. Love it. Uh, any ideas for getting referrals? I used to get a lot of referrals and the way I did it was, it, it's, this is going to sound like a no brainer, but it was just by asking, we'd be on a phone call we, there's a relationship there. And I'd say, look, have I done a good job for you? Yes. Do you have any, anybody, you know, I have some bandwidth. I have some extra time. Anybody you could refer. It was as simple as that. I never got more complicated than it. Yep. Uh, what's the number one thing you can do to differentiate yourself? Becoming the expert. Same thing. Yeah. Niching down. I love it. Uh, I didn't pay Rob to uh, say those answers, by the way. They're just all his. <laughs> is, it, is that stuff that you say? Oh, to- like totally. I mean, like, okay. you know, the number one thing we say is, you know, work out what you're really good at, work out the value that you offer customers, uh, and yeah. then just focus on that. And the yep. customers who need that will find you. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. and right. uh, But here's the thing. I think it's the, you know, there are two things that entrepreneurs suffer uh, shiny object syndrome and fear of missing out. And I think it's yep. the fear of missing out that stops people niching down. I mean, when you launched Drip, you could have said, okay, well, MailChimp does this and, and Aweber does this. And if I do this, like, I remember when you first started, it was just autoresponders, right? There was no broadcast functionality, That's right? right? And I was like, oh, now. really? But I want to broadcast, Rob, you know? And uh, eventually that came, yeah? But um, yeah. How, do you, how do you get over that fear of missing out? 
That's a really good question. Um, I think seeing that it works, like the first time I saw it work was in my consultancy. And as soon as I focused on .NET and I revamped our whole website, I pulled off all the references to PHP and WordPress and Cold Fusion and all that crap. And I said, look, I'm, we're WordPress ex experts. We are re registered .NET, blah, blah, blahs. We speak at conferences. And suddenly I was like, wow, I have a lot of, I actually reoccurred occur to me, I have a lot of credibility in this, a lot of experience. And it worked really well. And I just kept raising my rate. I got so much work. I raised my rate $10 an hour for like every three months I was raising it 10 bucks an hour just to see how far I could push it. And then I was like, this is it. So the first time it works for you, the fear starts to go away. And mm. I think with with drip the same thing it was kind of like i started floated the value proposition and it, people were interested and gave me their email address and so there was less fear it was it was validated right i didn't go on for a year saying this is the approach i tried to validate it early on to, to eliminate that fear this is something that's very common in the lean startup approach too is validating a hypothesis do you think yes. like it, it looks like the tools that you've built have kind of been designed to scratch your own itch. And also knowing that, you know, that this itch does exist in the larger community and that if, if you want to pay for something like this, other people probably will as well. But do you think how much, I mean, there's a lot of talk about the lean startup methodology and whether or not it's valid and blah, 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 blah. And there are a whole bunch of success stories that haven't followed the lean startup methodology that have worked. Do you think, I mean, what is it about, validating something before you go build something that you think is is crucial like do, do you think that's a, a a viable way of approaching it and an important way of, of doing it i do think it's viable when i any app that i launch i'm going to validate it as much as i can because the t amount of time and money you have to invest to get an app off the ground is tremendous even a small one it's just it's just too big of an, big of an investment but i don't believe you can validate something 100 percent right? You just got to do the best you can. And for me, the best I could do was emailing some founders I knew and saying, would you pay for this? And when they came, some came back with, oh my gosh, I would love this. Well, I was like, huh, all right, that's enough validation to start writing code. Now what's my next step? Next step, landing page, send ads to it, you know? And then it's like, huh, so people, so I'm actually getting a 20, 25% opt-in rate on cold traffic. People giving me their email address because that the sentence of, you know, in, increase your conversion rate using email is interesting to them. Well, I know I can, whether, whether it's what we're building now, or whether it's it's something I can build. I know that I can build something that can increase conversion rates with email, so I'm at least gonna keep going. So that's how I validate. I never think, oh man, I got this dialed, I'm 100% locked in and now I'm gonna go in a basement. Never did that, you know? So I do think there's value to it. Um, I think that we fall in the trap, uh, what, what are, it's the uh, scratch your own itch fallacy, I call it. It's mm. like, I don't build things because they scratch my own itch, but scratching my own itch is good, then go validate with other people, right? It's not enough to scratch your own itch. That may have worked in 2005, but the market's too crowded now. Everybody's scratched their own itch because 37 Signals told us to. Yeah. And so there's, too, there's, there's too many project management apps, bug trackers, and CRM systems as a result, right? Yeah. So here's the thing. If you, know, you get like a 20% opt-in rate from Facebook ads to a landing page, and then you don't build anything, it goes back to that, 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 that original question earlier. Like, aren't you then embarrassed that you've got all these email addresses and you're not going to build what they want because you haven't validated it? <laughs> they wouldn't care or remember. They would <laughs> totally not care or remember. They have no idea, honestly. Yeah. Right. And in fact, if you don't email your, your, those people every six to eight weeks, they're going to forget who you are. And that's yeah. another big mistake I see, right? If you wait six months and then email them, hey, look, I launched. They're like, who are you? Wait, <laughs> when did I opt in? Right? Nobody remembers. We all... We're all doing the same thing and opting into a bunch of stuff. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, man, yeah. I love it. Um, when do you know? Like, what is, your, what is your point for going, okay, this is validated. Let's, let's go into production. Is it a gut um, feeling? Yeah. I mean, for me, I just said, look, if I can get 10 people to, to commit to 99 bucks a month, then let's at least start writing code. That will give me enough uh, uh, impetus to then try to try to run the ads and spend a couple grand. And that was a gut feeling at that point. And when I saw, you know, if it had been a 5% opt-in rate, Ooh, that'd have been tough. Right. But yeah. it was 15 to 20 to start. And then I did a little optimization and got in 25. I was like, man, that's a, that's a really good opt-in rate on cool traffic. Mm. So I, I don't know, I, I guess gut feeling, but it's kind of rule of thumb though. Right. It's like, we all know, well, if you've done this before, you know, what the general you know, uh, conversion rate should be opt-in rate. And you know what the general reaction will be when you mention something to people, especially if I guess when I, so when I emailed the, the founders, I didn't say, 
I never said, do you think this is a good idea? Because I don't care if they think it's a good idea. What I told them is, would you pay $99 for this? That's what I want to find out. Yeah. Please reply yes or no. You know, that was really the bottom line, right? Would you pay, not do you think? Think. Okay. And yeah. what, what, And in that, in that initial email... What did you show them? Any screenshots or any wireframes or how nope. did you like? You just described it in words. I did. I did. I said this is the pro- the problem colon. You know, is the problem in bold and then colon. I'm trying to solve this. The email marketing solutions aren't doing this. And uh, here's what I propose. And then a couple of bullets. Um, that was really it. It was just trying. It was a description of what I was doing, the value proposition, rather than how it was going to work. Right? You can't go into the mechanics of it. And even if you get, if you give them a screenshot, I think it's too much information early yep. on. That's why I never put screenshots on landing pages, because right. people don't care what the app looks like. What they care is what problem does it solve at that point. They care later. I follow up with screenshots in the emails as I'm building up to launch. As you remember, I mm. you know I sent three or four emails, and that was filled with then screenshots. But it wasn't just random screenshots. It was like this is the screen that, that actually shows you how much money you're going to make from it or that, you know, shows mm. you the value you're getting, that kind of stuff. Yeah. And because early on, those screenshots can actually, pe- people might look at a screenshot and say, well, this is great if it solves that problem, but I hate the interface that you're toying with, yes. so I don't like it. That's right. And that, but the interface can change. You can improve that later. You know, it's, yeah. that's yeah, things yeah. That, are le- that, can ch- that are less relevant at that point. And people do, I, me as well, you get hung up on, on the look or the feel or the whatever. It's, yeah. it's too detailed too early, yeah, yeah. in my opinion. Hey, uh, just before we wrap up, what is the future for uh, Get Drip? Where do you think Get Drip is going to be in 12 months' time? Are you going to kind of get into the marketing automation space and try and take on an Infusionsoft or? I don't, yeah, I don't think take on Infusionsoft because they're so, they're so big, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, they're like, it'd be like taking on MailChimp. Like, I don't see that as a viable goal for me, but I do think there's room. There's tons of room and it's, it's lightweight marketing automation. Mm-hmm. So that's, that's the space that I'm hitting. So I think I will be in their market. Um, and frankly, we're, we're starting to grow pretty well now that we've introduced the, the, the marketing automation stuff. So, And do you get, do you get, uh, get tripped to a point where you just uh, have some bandwidth and you go start something new? Is that, is that what you think Rob's going to be doing over the next few years? Not within 12 months for sure. I think drip is going to be another two to two to four years for me at least. Um, I don't know if I'll start something. I don't know if I'll do another app from scratch, to be honest. This, this was fun, but kind of done with that i'll either acquire in the future or i've been doing some angel investing and i might just do the advisor and write up another book or something awesome. of course i say i say that and my wife says that's going to last about two years and until you get bored yep. <laughs> well i want to thank you very much for spending so much time with us on the wp elevation podcast i really appreciate it i'm so glad ruben suggested that i uh connect with you because i've learned a ton and my head's spinning i'm gonna go make a bunch of notes and get a whole bunch of new stuff on my to-do list as a result of this interview so thank you very much um what's the number one piece of advice you would give any entrepreneur trying to build their own business whether it's an app or whether it's a consulting business whatever it is what's the number one thing that they should do it's to keep trying like we talked about earlier because the the first one you try is not going to work i had Mm. five or six failures before i had a success and then once you have that first success keep double down on it yeah awesome uh finally oh where can people reach out and say thanks rob um, you know, if, so I'm on Twitter, uh-huh. it's at Rob Walling. And then my podcast is startups for the rest of us. I'm there every week, 30 to 40 minutes talking about this kind of stuff. Awesome. We'll put all the links in the show notes, uh, underneath the video, of course, at wpelevation.com slash Rob Walling or one word, all lowercase, no spaces, no hyphens, no underscores, you know, the drill. Uh, finally, who would you like me to try and interview and why? So have you have you interviewed David Heenberger from Fat Cat Apps? No, it's I have word, not. So he has a couple WordPress plugins, and he's got a really interesting story. He travels the world. He's a location independent entrepreneur, and I really respect what he what he he's doing. I met him in uh, Scotland, and uh, he, he's got a good story. So awesome. Like what's what's, what's his last name? Heenberger. H e h e n burger. But FatCatApps.com is where you can get in touch with him. He has a podcast as well about. WordPress stuff. I don't listen to it. But cool. Yeah. All right. Well, David Heenberger, I'm coming to get you courtesy of Rob Walling. Keep your eyes on your inbox. Hey, Rob, thank you once again, man. I really appreciate all the time you spent with us and I wish you all the best for the future.
Absolutely. It was my pleasure. Cheers. Well, I hope you enjoyed meeting Rob Walling as much as I did. My head is still spinning and racing with ideas and things that we can be doing better in our business. I hope you learned a lot from it as well. Of course, this episode is sponsored by Video User Manuals, the plugin that puts 60 video tutorials in your client's WordPress dashboard to teach them how to use WordPress, WooCommerce, and SEO by Yoast. And you can get it now for $1 for your first month. And then it's $24 a month after that. So take it for a spin for your first month for just one buck. Put it on some client sites and see how it works and see the uh, the true power of it in action. Uh, subscribe to the podcast at wpelevation.com slash subscribe and get access to a free content creation webinar. The moment you subscribe, you'll automatically get access to a free content creation webinar to show you how to create more content for your website and you can then take this stuff and teach your clients. Visit the show notes for this episode at wpelevation.com slash Rob Walling, R-O-B-W-A-L-L-I-N-G. Uh, all the links, all the show notes, everything you need, the coupon code to take get drip for a 60-day trial uh, will be at that, uh, that link, wpelevation.com slash Rob Walling. And remember, Tell us underneath this video how you've used email marketing in your consulting business and Rob will swing by in a couple of weeks and award the prize. He's giving away two one-year pro plans of GetDrip valued at $1,200 each. So that's a massive prize that you could win. I hope you're enjoying the podcast as much as I am. Please get on over to iTunes and give us a review. It really helps us uh, rank in the search results over there and get more listeners so that more people can benefit and learn from what we're bringing you on the podcast. Next week, we have Pippin Williamson from Pippin's Plugins, of course, the genius behind easy digital downloads and a bunch of other cool stuff happening over there. Stick around for that next week on the podcast. Until then, go elevate.